Okay. Hello, I'm Beverly Chambers, um, founder and CEO of I Want to Be Fashion Buyer.com, um, which I set up with the purpose of being the conduit between um, fashion retail and young talent. Um, we run a unique six month fashion buying and planning program uh, where our students study with us uh, whilst we're getting to work one or two days a week in the buying office of one of our fabulous intern partners. Joining me today um, is Bridget Veals, General Manager of Women's Wear, Footwear and Accessories at David Jones. Um, Bridget, like me, hails from the UK and has over 25 years experience working across some of the world's leading fashion brands. She's an industry leader specializing in the evolution of fashion buying, trend and operations. And as the current general manager of women's wear, footwear and accessories, um, Bridget oversees the uh, organization's buying strategy, operations across various categories. She's passionate about making a positive impact in the global fashion industry and has become a champion for change, driving initiatives across circular fashion and reducing environmental impact made by the production of clothing. So welcome, Bridget. Thank you, that's quite an introduction and I definitely didn't write it myself, so. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's what we have people for yeah. <laughs> anyway um what i'd like to do bridget is start and take you back to the start of your career and ask you what drew you into retail and particularly into fashion buying <laughs> so when i was 12 years old i went on a holiday to of all places um belfast which is in northern ireland um which you wouldn't send many kids on holiday to, but my um, grandmother lived there and relatives, my dad was from Belfast. And it was there that I, um, actually my grandmother taught me how to crochet um, and also then how to sew. So she had a sewing machine. And as a leaving gift from Belfast on that holiday, I acquired my first sewing machine. And when I got back to the UK, I literally just self-taught myself, to be honest with you, um, and started doing um, basic things. I had an elder sister who was um, very into having new outfits for going out to um, local nightclubs and things like that. She was a bit older. And so I actually just learned how to sew. I then did a textile course at 16, went off to college and did um, fashion course in as one of my a levels and how to pattern make um, to um sorry there's a bit of an echo there it might be elizabeth you can put yours on mute i might think thank you um so i i did fashion and textiles as an a level that was really where my passion lay and um then when it came to university i was very fortunate to get into Leeds University which had a founding faculty of textiles and I did textile management which was really a way of saying that I didn't want to be a fashion designer but I was definitely interested in fashion in textiles and um, in the management side I really wanted to make sure that I had a more commercial side to to it so that was my um early kind of entry into knowing that fashion was where I was going to end up uh, I then did a little bit of traveling, which brought me to Australia for the first time and returned to the UK and was very fortunate then to start my career with what was the, called the Burton Group. So that was the um, Debenhams, Topshop Group, Dorothy Perkins, etc. So huge organization of the Burton Group. And I became a buyer's admin at Debenhams department store. Um, and that's where I, I worked my way up really from been a buyer's admin but in a very very structured organization with incredible training I would say at that time yeah so uh, if you think back to your first role as a buyer how do you feel the role of the buyer has changed from then to now um to be honest with you I uh, has it changed that much? For me, it was a bit, little bit different because the buying role was very, very product focused. When I came to Australia, I found that there was a product developer role and there was a buyer's role and there was a planner's role. 
and coming from the UK we were very much the buyer was the product but we didn't we had designers doing developing so it was slightly different at the end of the day the buyer's role is to it's so much a gut instinct with what you do with being a buyer and I think that's why some people know whether they're a buyer or a planner so yeah. you you know instinctively whether you've got the confidence to say that is the product that you're going to um spend money on so I feel like that doesn't go away the you know the systems have improved the way that you can forecast has improved <laughs> the planning side I think has moved along a long way in terms of what resources you can have um you've got obviously the internet you've got more you've got more um accessibility to trends and what's happening in the world but the actual gut feeling of whether you're a good buyer or an average buyer or you shouldn't be a buyer is um is still exactly the same I would say okay all right um what I'd like to do now is move on and talk um, about some of the things that you and your team do in your daily role um and one of the things that people we've we did a, a, a questionnaire and people are interested in is where do you and your team get your trend information and how do you decide on which are the right trends for your customer so look, working for David Jones, you can't really argue with the fact that we have accessibility to some of the most amazing brands around the world. And so myself and my buyers are exposed to seeing very early what is trending internationally. And here we work with we work with the best of Australian designers. So the buyers get access to what the um, designers are doing. We travel to the United States, to Europe etc and we do attend um fashion shows so and and actually even more so than attending a fashion show it's almost seeing what the fashion crowd are wearing you can see the trends change within six months of you know two years ago every or three years ago when we traveled last you couldn't go to a show without everybody wearing the white sneaker the chunky dad trainer so you knew that that was happening and now I've just traveled and everybody's in um, sparkly shoes and, you know, crystals. So that's a big change in two and a half years. But, you know, you, you actually just get exposed to what is happening from, from travel, from seeing the brands at the very early stages. So we get to go into the showrooms of these amazing brands that we work with. And we get to go to the fashion shows of these amazing brands. And that really does expose you to what is happening from a trend perspective we then get to see other amazing retailers internationally and you you follow those trends they don't happen overnight so you've got time to be on trend okay and when we're looking at you've just you know you've just done um a recently done an overseas trip so can you just tell us what happens before during and after an international buying trip because you just don't turn up and sit there at the catwalk and go oh that was lovely glass of champagne and off you go do you um no we wish that was the case but um so before we traveled there's a lot this this is where your planning really comes to its forefront so the buyers need to be absolutely prepared with post seasons of what's worked our store distribution where we see opportunities so um from a financial perspective all the financials are done in preparation now if they they can easily change when we travel so a brand that you may have thought that you were going to decline or grow may not show the best collection so we're flexible when we're traveling but we have overall um very much a business plan we have objectives of we want to bring in new brands we have brands that we want to be growing brands that we want to talk about um having more space in our stores or personalization of space etc so we don't just do the um fashion buying we have meetings with the brands on the long-term strategy and and really sharing david jones vision and strategy with brands in order to acquire those um really important new brands that we want to bring into the business Okay, so um, if I if I dare ask you, what are we all supposed to be wearing this season? Sparkles. I, honestly, if if there's anything, it's all about sequins and shine and corsetry and lace details, and you know, there's a lot of silver um, happening. So it was um, and a lot of tailoring actually. So mm. whether oversized tailoring. Um, so it, it was definitely more of a um, cleaner, 
color palettes, um, saying that we have to observe it from a, this is what's happening in Europe. Australia is a completely different country. We embrace more color, more print, we're more, we're, our lifestyle is very different. So we don't just focus on that. So we certainly plan to be on trend with looking at the European trends and what was happening, but we have to make it relevant to the Australian market. And we stay very, very conscious of not going into a, you know, designer international bubble of yeah. thinking that that will all translate for our customer here. So we keep a very clear customer lens at the Australian consumer and um, wants definitely wants international brands and that aesthetic, but we also have an Australian lifestyle that we, we need to fulfill. I suppose the fortunate thing at the moment is that so many of our incredible Australian brands are trending internationally as well. So we're, we're not just seeing international brands, but we're seeing our own brands now in the department stores of the best retailers around the world. Excellent. Wow. So, um, I'm going to talk now about sustainability, um, and obviously that's come to the fore in recent years uh, with the emergence of companies renting, reselling, repairing. And I know that this is um, this is a, a, a subject that's really close to your heart. So, what's happening with David Jones in this area? So, David Jones, um, we as a our parent company in South Africa has what we call a good business journey. So, we've always been part of having a um, focus on sustainability and how we do business really um, and and not just from a what product we buy but from you know in terms of climate change our resources in stores etc lighting so we, we've got clear targets what we need to achieve as a business and um, very clear targets also from a community minded um, programs but in terms of sustainability we um, even pre-COVID had started what we call a platform of Mindfully Made. And Mindfully Made was really acknowledging whether um, the brands that we were doing were Australian made, whether they were kind to animals, how they were sourced. And, and it was all, it's always a given. Um, every single brand in David Jones signs um, uh, their ethical trading so nobody would be allowed to trade with us unless they signed up that they obviously source ethically and um, we haven't done fur for 15 years we've been very strict about that same with mohair rabbit hair etc so we've always had strict policies and um, during covid or just at the beginning we were already talking to Glam Corner about rental um, and Glam Corner are exceptional partners that we, we have. And we took a leap of faith right at the beginning of COVID to say that we will get into the rental. And we actually opened our first rental store in the Elizabeth Street as we were doing the refurbishment. So we took a brave move, move of being in rental during COVID um, and actually that has been hugely successful for us. So we partner very closely with Glam Corner on um, offering rental online through them. And they are absolute business experts at doing it. So at David Jones, we, we're happy to partner with the right people and not presume that we could do that ourselves. So we formed that partnership that has led to things like um, repair. So a lot of the times in stores, you'll find a button's fallen off, makeup's on something. So we actually now send that product to Glam Corner, who can sustainably dry clean, repair for us, etc. And that puts it back into um, the circular economy. We also do some resell from that, that you, they, at the end of the cycle of where we see it being rental, um, it could be resold or we then donate to the um, Salvation Army um, and Red Cross. So it, it ultimately doesn't, it always ends up going to the right end use. Uh, we then partnered as well with a company called Blue Spinach who do resell, luxury resell. And we recently opened our first resell store in Elizabeth Street as well, which is going really well. So we've been online with resell for over a year but we now have got it in the Elizabeth Street store. And so we're using the Elizabeth Street as a bit of an incubator for rental resale with the view that we would like to certainly get that to Melbourne and then on to every capital um, city 
So that is our plan, is that we would represent resell, repair, reuse, recycle in all of our states um, in the future. But mainly it's been about choosing the right partner. And do you see more and more brands that you're talking to starting to look in, into this into this area? Yeah, look, the, you can't be in retail without seeing it with a different future. And I think um, what we what we're trying to do is say rather than competing, we'd rather collaborate with brands. So lots of people are like, well, why would you rent when um, you know? Why do you want to do rental? Does it stop people buying? Some of our brands were fearful that you know we we would start rental and then we wouldn't be buying so much. But actually, the person who rents, um, let's say a Zimmerman dress, could never have afforded the Zimmerman dress. But rather than maybe pay eighty dollars to buy a one use garment from a fast fashion retailer they're using that to rent the Zimmerman dress and that's the way that we see it is that we're not losing a customer we're just transacting in a different way so I think it's the right thing to do we certainly don't see it as exclusive to David Jones and we're, we're happy to partner with people and encourage other um other people to do it the same with uh, Reloop we introduce Reloop we do it through Glam Corner which is when when you purchase, you can say, I want to in the future rent this um, or sell it to somebody. So ours is more of a, what we call a concierge service through um, through Glam Corner, but you can do it through the vault to do that kind of um, reload, resell thing. So we're, we're actually kind of encouraging that everybody should talk, should consider what the end use of their purchase will, will be and making sure it has the longest life possible. Yeah, I, I, it's really interesting how it's really come to the fore. And I think that um, certainly with that younger generation, I know my daughter, who's 25, it is very much an op shopper. And it's very much about how much I've bought new and how much I've bought that is from is secondhand has come from an op shop. So really, really interesting. My puppy's now decided to join in. <laughs> so I just want to talk about um, the pandemic and the really that it changed the way that we shop just one second. <laughs> there we go she can join in so um so the pandemic obviously changed the way that we shopped with a huge growth in online shopping what differences do you see in range planning for bricks and mortar as opposed to online is it different are there considerations that impact on each channel from an assortment perspective so i think with online, it's almost that endless aisle of opportunity that you can certainly house more on the online store, depending on how you interact with the brands. Um, sometimes it can be as simple as something that you know has got no hanger appeal, but looks great on the body. We might put just in the online store. Um, we try to make sure that we have the best assortment actually in a store, but we might put extend, extended sizes into the online store. So um, really to maximize the sell through a product it's allowed us to be a little bit more savvy about how much we need to send everywhere and the customer should then be quite seamlessly able to get a size or a different color through the online store so it's just opened up a lot more opportunity I would say uh, I think what we found very fortunate was that during the pandemic we could moved to the online store and we actually kept all of our store teams um, working and moved a lot of our um, in-store activity to being the fulfillment store for the online store. So it really works seamlessly of keeping our, you know, we employ a lot of people and the pandemic obviously saw a lot of people step down and we as a business chose that that wasn't what we wanted to do, that financially we would ensure that we kept all of our team members. So we actually really started to operate nearly all of our stores as fulfillment centers for the online store. And then as we opened up to bricks and mortar and the customer has been excited about coming back in, we've been very lucky that our store teams are set up now to do both. And it also meant that our store teams were less fearful, I suppose, of what the online store could do. And what historically, maybe five years ago, could have been an us and them way of retailing has become very much about one store approach and an omni-channel approach to um to online shopping 
Yeah, it's 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 interesting that you know when I talk to people, it seems as if we were heading down that path, but it just accelerated that transition. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it absolutely did. But also, I think it opened up that a lot of people who had been fearful of online shopping learned how to do it because you had no no choice. Um, and now I think it just means that we've got a different we've got many more consumers engaging with our online store but also it can just be for browsing and then coming back into store so it's it's been a an unfortunate way to get a bit of a win-win with yeah. how to grow your online store yeah it, it's really interesting I think it, you know I, I saw myself do this I went to the race as I said yesterday and so before I went shopping I looked online and Maya looked online and David Jones had almost decided what I was going to purchase but then came into the store and it was almost like I had a visual hit list in my mind. What did I want to look for? Who had, which brand had it? And it's instead of sort of just as you would have done, you know, before wandered around aimlessly in the hope of finding something, it was more like a mission shop. And I certainly think that very much for me, it saved me an awful lot of time. I knew where I wanted to go, what I wanted to look at, and I could even show the picture in store, this is the one I want. Can you show me where this one is, please? So I certainly, you know, take that um, as how I'm now using on, you know, omni-channel shopping. I do hope that was a David Jones store. I bought, I tell you, I bought a hat, shoes, and a bag at David Jones. Right, all my, <laughs> all my areas. <laughs> okay, so um, I want to move on now. We sent out a questionnaire, which I mentioned to our audience prior to finding out. So just so we could you know, find out what people really wanted to know and talk about. And so I'm just going to ask you some of the questions that um, either they voted for or that they've posed for themselves. So our most voted for question was, what skills and attributes do you look for in a buyer? Um, so as a buyer, the most important thing is almost your interpersonal skills. And um, either because you need to manage people, you need to work really collaboratively with a, um, a planner and marketing teams, and most importantly, with your vendors and your brands. And that relationship with the vendors um, and our brand partners <clears throat> is, the most, is certainly just the most important thing that we do. We, we want to collaborate. Um, so the ability to work well with other people in addition to obviously having the instincts of a buyer commercially, um, I think a buyer, it, it's not even every Monday morning anymore. It's every day you see how successful you are in the sale. So there's not many roles where you're constantly um, reappraised, I suppose, of, <laughs> of what you do each day. But in addition to the fact that you, you've got to be commercially successful, you've got to be able to spot trends, it is really about your ability to form good relationships within a working team because no buyer, I, I come back to the idea that um, I think being a buyer's admin was probably the best thing that ever happened to me because nobody, no, nobody's got a bestseller and nobody's got anything to sell until that buyer's admin puts the order on the system. Mm. And I, I think that that's always made me value my um, more junior team because they're only juniors for a while they're going to be your future buyers but what they learn as a buyer's admin is just certainly really important so um, that collaboration and ability to really treat your team with respect and um, you know be able to lead a team is very very important but the and the culture that your buyers create within their own buyership is yeah so important so my buyers and planners I really rely on to be the culture of their team so that we can build a bigger team that's got a great culture to work within so I, I very much look for them to be um, very decent human beings I would say and um, nice people to be around and and that seems to me that you're coming very much from what I would call a um, feminine perspective of leadership which is about collaboration and less from the, well, I'd say the traditional masculine role of competition. Would you, would you feel that's, that's. Um, I'm probably not going to um, judge on, on that. I, I mean, we're, we're a very female industry 
certainly until it gets to the top. Fortunately, I, I've got to say at David Jones, 50% of our executive team is female. So I, I think that that's quite a shift and certainly a shift from when I first joined David Jones, where it was, um, I think somebody described it as, and we can laugh about it now, pale and stale. There were a lot of middle-aged men <laughs> in blue suits and, you know, very, yeah, I mean, the, the the diversity just was seriously lacking in our business, I would say. Um, and now I feel that we are a much more diverse executive group. But I, I don't think being a female is diversity. So I, I, I find that a struggle. Um, but overall, I think managing your team maybe with more compassion um, I think works more effectively. I don't think anybody gets anything from being over competitive or um, or not compassionate to their team. Uh, I the the benefits I think of being more in touch and more collaborative and more aware of people as individuals, etc. Um, I think you get a lot more from your team from just treating them with the same respect that you would want yourself. So it, it's not <clears throat> something that I. I focus on I suppose it's just something that I hope just happens within my team and hopefully through some leadership um down but it, it's an expectation not a um not something that I give I don't over analyze it to yeah. to lead that way yeah. I just hope that that's the way it is um, so our next question um is one that's what the both Sophia and um Janine wished to ask, which is what advice would you give to someone who is at the start of their career and wishes to get into buying or planning? So I think there's a there's a big difference between being a buyer and a planner. And the way that I look look at it, and, and actually when I first came to Australia, I don't think planning had the respect mm. that um, it now has and that it really deserves. And I, I think Beverly, you've done a lot in this area of really building up the capability of planning and um, being a successful planner. I, I think when you've got a great planner and a great buyer, it's a bit like a great marriage. Like it's just, you, you can do great things together and be usually successful. So uh, I think knowing whether you're going to be a planner or a buyer, a good buyer is very definitely financial and analytical, but you shouldn't be the one who wants to do all the planning and all the numbers. You, you have to trust in somebody else to be able to do that for you so that you can be very much the product focused person. And I think most planners know that they're planners because they like maybe fashion. They're great with numbers, but they know ultimately that they just don't have that confidence and that gut feeling to go, I'm going to buy that and I'm going to buy a thousand of them, you know? So I think the difference is a buyer will be able to make that move to say, I, I know I'm going to buy that and I can stand behind buying that product and that, that range or that, that, you know, designer, et cetera. And that comes with experience, with confidence, but also I think you, you've either got it or you haven't. Yeah. I mean, I, I really talk about having an eye and whilst you can, you know, and, and we do, you, you can develop people's skills and you can hone your eye, but if you haven't got it there in the first place, I think you can't put it there. And I very much see, you know, with our program and we, we put everybody through the same program, but we very much halfway through go, you, we feel you're more buyer led, we feel you're more planner led. And then with the internship say, now in the internship, go and spend the rest of the internship with the buyer or with the planner and, and learn that those the key skills in, the, in that role. Okay, so, um, and this was a question, let me see, I think that David, Laura and Anna wanted to know, um, and that is what do you think it takes to go beyond the buyer role and progress your career as a leader in the industry? Um, you know, sometimes it's just being in the right place at the right time with the right manager. So I think you. some people are just naturally ambitious and will be following that career path and, and very much eyes on the prize of how high they want to go. And I think some people just naturally fall into it. And either the one thing that I think happens is in retail 
you've got to work really hard. I don't think it's an easy career. Um, so I think it it is always going to be hard work. But certainly if, if I think about becoming a GM at David Jones, I don't think I set out to do that when I was a buyer's admin. All I wanted to be when I was a buyer's admin was a buyer. And then when I was a buyer, I kind of naturally progressed because I, I probably was quite successful at what I did. So it, it moved me forward. And, and actually, one of the things that when I moved, when I first came over, I was with Maya. And I very fortunately in the UK done what was called Designers at Debenhams and that collaboration with working with designers. And I was in the fortunate position that Maya wanted to do something similar at yeah. that time. And the product development skills within that business weren't as strong as maybe they are today. So I had from my training in the UK, something that was a gap here in Australia to yeah. offer. So, um, you know, but I was one of maybe many buyers in the UK who could possibly have done that. So it was just the fact that I was in a position to take that opportunity here. So I think I'm not one of these people who is obviously super ambitious. I think I have worked hard, been successful and been recognized by maybe good managers as capable to move forward. But I've not been one of those people who has been hands up. I've got to get to this level and I want to be this. Uh, I've just naturally just kind of maneuvered my way up, I would say. That's probably not the most ambitious thing to tell anybody on my <laughs> screen. But I think, and there's nothing wrong. I, I, I work with a lot of, um, and it's not a female or male, but I, I work with a lot of, um, you know, 30 to 40 year old females now here. And I see some of my team being more ambitious than others. And some of them are like, I want to be a GM. How do I get there? And <laughs> others, I think, are just naturally, some people you talk to and you say, you know, you're capable of being a future GM and they're they're kind of like oh but you know I'm I'm not quite ready so I, you see it through with different people some people are just naturally go-getters and some people are naturally talented and will get there at the same speed I would say okay all right and um before I open up to the audience um I've got a question from Madeline and she wants to know what is the proudest moment of your career <laughs> um Oh, look, there's, you know, after 25 years, there's, there's been hopefully a few, but um, I think becoming a buyer in the first place was like my, my big moment. I really, really wanted to be a buyer. And I, I worked in, in the UK, there was no fast tracking to it. You really went through your two years of being a buyer's admin, three years of being a assistant buyer. You had to work across many areas. You couldn't just be focused on you know, being good in one category, you you were really put through making sure your your skill set was there before you were let loose with anybody's checkbook. So it was a hard slog. I remember having to think about I'm going to be in before my buyer. I'm going to leave after my buyer. I'm going to work really really hard. So I think that first step of becoming a junior buyer was kind of like my my big moment and that ability to then travel because I loved traveling and um, it was that kind of thing oh my god I'm now going to go to Paris and New York and I'm buying trips and then probably since being in Australia I, I don't know how many of you have seen the Elizabeth Street <laughs> floor but my project was um, the ground floor and the seventh floor and the seventh floor is a beautiful shoe floor and um I remember when we were doing the planning of that floor, showing it to a, a luxury brand that I won't mention. And they kind of looked at me and went, you've got no chance. You know, <laughs> there's no way this is going to happen. And then when we opened that shoe floor, the amount of people who just said, oh, my God, this is beyond what we would have expected in retail in Australia. And um, I think that that was it when we, we had managed to deliver something that even, you know, people very high up in the industry didn't think was going to happen here. And the fact that we we could partner with so many brands who wanted to be in David Jones in a beautiful location like Elizabeth Street was definitely one of the, the proudest moments. And I have to say, it is a fantastic, uh, like mind blowingly beautiful, um, you know, foot, footwear. I just like, it just, I, I sat there and I sat, I literally just sat for 20 minutes going, 
you know, kid in the candy store. Yeah. I, I And I, I go into the store now and I, every time I walk onto that floor, I'm still kind of like, wow, this is, it's great. I love it. And, we, and we've done a similar thing now in um, Melbourne. I think what it did, every, you know, it's like Melbourne kept saying, then why don't we have this in Melbourne? And it was like, yeah, obviously, why don't we have it in Melbourne? So we, opening the shoe floor very recently in Melbourne was another moment. But I, I don't think you can capture what the first time of seeing the Elizabeth Street store. But I'm certainly usually proud of the um, level three of our Burke Street store, I think, is a magnificent floor for, for women to be able to shop on. It certainly is. OK, I'm going to open it up to the floor now. Um, if perhaps you can, if you'd like to ask um, Bridget a question. No. Yes, Bridget, I would like to Penny? ask a question. Yes, Janine. Okay. I used to be a buyer, but in a different industry uh, for Apple Computer. And I always wanted to make that jump over to fashion, but I never quite got there. And I ended up having children, getting married, having children. And now I've returned to the workforce and I still want to be that buyer for the fashion industry. Uh, and I'm just wondering, but it was 20 years ago, so a lot of things have changed. Um, and I'm just wondering what sort of thing would make you stand out and give me, someone like me, an opportunity? Look, I'll be really honest with you. It's, it's a hard industry just to jump back into. And so the advice I would give you is to probably just take a role that leads back up to buying. So even, you know, a buyer's assistant role that you can kind of get a feel for where the industry is now. You could be usually capable of what you're, you're doing. And then you get that exposure to knowing where, whether that buying role is the one that you definitely want to do within fashion buying. But a lot of our buyer's assistant roles, I mean, they're quite admin heavy, to be honest with you, but the ones who take it to the next stage and do the over and above and become a buyer is because their passion for buying is there and they show that flair as a buying assistant. But I don't think that there's an easy way in to just jump into being a fashion buyer without experience and without really knowing that that's what you want to do. Okay, great, great answer. Um, Kemi, would you like to ask a question? Yes, I will. Thank you very much. First of all, I'd like to say a very big thank you. I mean, such a great opportunity for me to be on this. Um, thank you for organizing this. Um, and um, thank you, Bridget. I mean, quite nice um, presentation. I'm a small business owner. I mean, fashion retail. I Fashion is not my background. I mean, banking is my background, but I eventually ventured into um, um, fashion because I really like fashion. So I have, you know, a business of my own. So my question is this. I mean, I know my customers, I mean, even maybe passes by because my business is in a very good mall in Lagos. I'm, I'm, I'm sitting in Nigeria. So this is actually like almost 2 a.m. here. So my I goodness. started for this. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, so when I saw this, I was like, no, I have to jump into this. I mean, my only small experience of um, anything like this was um, I took a little course um, from the University of Arts London on, you know, fashion buying so I would say I really don't have them but I would say I have the instinct to be able to you know buy good things for my store because I, I would say well most times I have like an 80 percent or 85 percent success like when you were saying that you could see your success every day that is I mean I, I'm sure what you meant is when your products are getting bought or not getting bought that, yeah. that's what I think it is but my question is there have been times when I go to do this buying because I buy for my store and I would think this is really good. This, I mean, I don't really do trends. I do more because I'm more classic. My customers are more classic and all of that. So, and we have just one season here in Nigeria. So it's not about you know, weather or anything. But there have been times when I'm shocked at why I could have gotten wrong. You know, where I think, oh, I think this will move, this will sell. And it's just sitting there. So I've always said to myself, anytime I have an opportunity to talk to a very good buyer, that I'm going to ask that, okay, what is that thing I need to, is it that I, I'm too quick to think something would, would sell and, and then it's a wrong decision? So I think if any buyer got it 100% right, they, we'd be writing, writing checks to ourselves, wouldn't we? So it's not, 
that there's never a hundred percent success rate. So your 80% is probably really good. And I think the difference, you're listening to your customer every day. Now, what I would say is the product that didn't sell, I, I would ask your customers. I mean, ask them to try it on, see what, see what it is that they feed you back. The information I can give you will never be as good as what your customer is going to tell you about the products, about what they like, what they don't like. And I think what you've got the benefit of is being so close to your customer, which is unbelievable. We, we, we hope to be really close to our customer. We're close to our store teams. We take a lot of feedback. We expect our buyers to be out in store. We don't expect it to be about their personal choice. We expect it to be very customer centric. Um, but what you've got there, I think is it's amazing that you can be one-to-one -one with the customer every day and so i would be inclined to when it doesn't sell ask the customer no i actually don't have one one for one on my, my customer because i have a team of, of yeah i mean we have a team so most times i'm not really on the shop floor so right. really most times when i see that something is not selling you know i go back to my team i'm like okay what are the customers saying and they're like they just don't think it's pretty or they just don't want to try. I'm like, can you tell them to at least try it on? You know, because they're them, like, you know, you said something about some clothes are not actually hang up on here. Hanger, but on the body. Yeah. yeah, it's hard to get them to make sure they convince the customers back. Um, I mean, sometimes it can be just then how you visually merchandise it and your, your mannequins, et cetera, and getting it on a mannequin, getting it on the store teams. I think um, when I've worked in more vertical businesses, we would certainly encourage um, the actual store teams to be wearing that product, which then lets the customer see how it's worn and they can admire it on your, your team. So I think that that's probably an, an easy win to, to start to move through products is to get it actually on um, looking great on your own team so the customer can see it looks great on. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for staying up at 2 a.m. To, to listen in. That's some really great advice. Um, I've got a question from Geraldine. She says she's currently a planner and would love to trans transition into buying. Um, and she wants to know how and have you seen this transition? Um, hi, Geraldine. Um, absolutely, we've seen it. Sometimes you've just got a great planner who you know is instinctively able to buy. Now, it depends on the product type as well. So some things I think a great planner can be really good at buying. Um, maybe like uh, there's different categories that are more numbers based. So sometimes with a category maybe like denim, I use, more, you know, I'd, I'd like to think my buyer is more of a financial buyer as opposed to buying Australian designer. So I think if you've got the instinct to think that you want to get into buying, then start with something that actually is quite um, almost numbers focused buying and move in that way. But I've seen many planners become successful um, buyers. Uh, again, it comes down to your instincts with products. So and sometimes you could be a more successful than a buyer because your financials will be so strong. But sometimes your financials could be too strong and it takes away your gut instincts as well. So it's you're, you're almost sometimes stopped by the numbers, um, whereas a buyer may push through them with that gut feeling of knowing and being able to see that, you know, or to see what you, you know the customer will want next. Um, that that's I think you're, you're you're absolutely right I've seen it and um and I always the advice I always give is I think that that even for buyers the more um the more financial knowledge that they have um is uh, it stands you in good stead so the more the more you can understand the numbers or the more you understand the process for a buyer I think the more you understand the process you might not be you might not be able to do a core line card yourself but you understand the process of doing the financial plan yeah. the WYSI the more you understand it um the better and the more that you're actually also willing to work with your planner so you know I, I completely agree with you that it's a it's the it's the marriage thing and I think I wrote something recently and said I see a buyer and planner as two sides of the same coin and they absolutely have got to be that close uh, um and they each bring their strengths to that to that team um 
and I think that if you've got a good eye, then you you can transition. That's what I've I've seen that happen many times. Okay, um, I think we have. Is it okay? I've got a Shari who said she started her fashion career at D DJs, um, and she'd love to know your opinion, um, Bridget, of what sets a good buyer apart from a great buyer. Um. Again, it comes down down to you can have a good buyer. I've, I, I, with no disrespect to my team, I know my good buyers and I know my great buyers. And I would say the difference is how they manage their brands and their relationships. And I think you can be a good buyer but you might not get the most out of either your team or your vendors or the other parts of the business. And a great buyer will have the confidence in what they do that they don't, that they can just be themselves and have that confidence then to work with other people really openly. They're not a closed book. And I think when you're a great buyer, you, you're not, you're not fearful to share your knowledge and to, um, and I, I suppose collaborate more. I don't think, I, I think you feel more able just to um, be part of a bigger team. And again, you can just tell, I think experience just tells you when, uh, if I think about, you know, the difference between, I'm, I'm thinking of two buyers, there's one I think will go really far and they've got, they've just got a natural instinct to, to make things bigger and better and to work with our brands and get the most out of people. I think that's why I'm saying I, somebody who can really get the most out of their team and nurture their, not only their own team. So they've got a great team underneath them and work with a great planner and then work really well with brands. So the brands want to do things with them. Them, every, everybody wants to kind of share in the success of working with that buyer is the difference. And I think when you're a good buyer, you're financially good and you've got, you know, you can deliver the numbers, but there's a little bit in you that protects them or you're, you don't share as much. And I think once you're a great buyer, you're really open to sharing um, your success or how you do things and people can just see it, feel it, and be part of that team and enjoy working with you. Okay, that's, um, I, 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 I think you're absolutely right. It's, it's about people. I mean, I think that what we know in life is that people who get on with people go further than people who don't get on with people. And, and if you can work with people, then in probably in all walks of life, it, it really helps. So I think we've come to the end um, and you must be exhausted from answering all of those questions, Bridget. Um, uh, and thank you for spending the time today. I have to say, you've got me actually to the point of going, I think I'm really missing being a buyer now. <laughs> so thank you for your time. I think it's been really insightful. Um, I hope everybody has enjoyed it as much as I have. And um, just say thank you very much. Oh, I'd like to thank everybody for joining and thanks Beverly for asking me it's a, a real honor to be asked to chat about the industry and um, hopefully I've been of some value in answering some of the questions and um, good luck to everybody on on the call with their their own buying pursuits so thank you very much thank, thank you. you thank you bye-bye thank you bye